guys. So we'll begin with the lecture two. Uh, but before that, I think I've arranged for an FIB lab for you. Uh, so I would be giving you a very brief description on um, how FIB works, uh, but I think I would do that at the end of lecture. Uh, so there are various dates they have proposed for FIB. Um, the person wanted Friday, uh, but I want the new postdoc that we have to somehow that she can you know help me in the in the process. So I'm trying to have the dates according to um, the person who would operate and person who would help. So I think I would post the date um, sometime next week. So we'll have two FIB sessions. I will try in those FIB sessions to demonstrate to you um, about uh, how does FIB works, why it is important, and what are the challenges that we have compared to the conventional methods. And uh, I would also start, I think, uh, depending upon how your lab begins, we'll also start applying ML uh, machine learning models on uh, in some of the images so that you get familiar with, uh, with uh, this labeling techniques. And for that, I would like to know how many of you know Python? Wow. <laughs> very basic, but the Python here that we'll use, it's a very basic tool. It's not something uh, very uh, you know, high level. Then I would like uh, to know that how many of you know Jupyter? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Very good. Uh, okay, so at least there are two or three students uh, say, I will subgroup that class into three projects. And the people who, who knows Jupyter and Python, they can lead the programming part and other can lead the, uh, lead the more understanding mm -hmm. part, right? So I would divide the students into uh, subgroups. Um, I think three of you, I think. Uh, so how many of you know Python here? Three, four, okay, okay. So the people who doesn't know computer programming, which is not the primary task of this class, the, the primary task is, is how to use any tool, whether machine learning uh, or the conventional tools in rightly labeling your images so that it saves your task. And we'll, go, we'll be going in detail with the object detection. So some of the classes I will uh, take with the object detection um, and discuss all the algorithms and we'll do small programming. I'll pick up there. So right now, you maybe already know this, but the uh... Yeah, like source is borderline depleted and a uh, week from today we want to so okay. maybe have slides. I received an email yesterday and they said that uh, okay, I suggested them either they do two two Fridays and I think 17th or 16th the Friday was free and was available. Maybe they have the plan to replace it by then. I think yeah, it'll be a week before that. They will Next just day, but okay. Right. So this this class will get challenging for you as you proceed. Um, but it's, I think, the most important class for really, you know, for all the people who are into, um, into nuclear engineering and want to do good in uh, characterization. So as we go, it will get a little bit uh, challenging. Okay, and I will start posting everything online. Um, today, I would like, first of all, to start uh, reviewing the basics. I will review optics. And once I have reviewed optics, I will discuss aperture and diaphragms, and then we'll talk about what is resolution. And then I would talk about what is FIB. And I would try to give you a very, uh, just a very initial idea of FIB. So I think, Ryan, you have some experience of using FIB, and who else? Started training for it last semester, but never got to, to use it. Yeah, because it's just <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And other people, um, any experience? No, no. Okay. Uh, so it would be interesting for, especially for the newcomers, to learn. Okay. Now. 
we did this in our school about um, the basic ray diagrams. So in the ray diagram, what I'm trying to tell you is, um, this is a very easy kind of diagram that we know. And it's a diagram that we have a convex lens here. And we have an object here. And that object, uh, if we want to have an image of this object using this convex lens, then this is the classical diagram that we know. So what is happening here in this diagram? So one thing I would speak again and again in this lecture is about the optic axis. So what is an optic axis? Optic axis is basically this line which is passing through the center of the microscope where you want to align your electron beam. And in your optical microscope, this optic axis is where you align all your optical lenses. It's the same thing. And to align your electron beam along the optic axis is where is the biggest challenge. This procedure in, in microscopy is known as alignment. And alignment itself takes good, good three to four session to learn. Because in the microscope, there are many, many lenses. It's not as, sim as simple as an optical lens. And you are aligning your microscope along that single axis. So you have a series of lenses, which are controlled by basically your their electrostatic lenses. So you are basically changing the lenses and controlling it. Now, before moving to that, we'll try to understand how an image is formed. So in this one, uh, we have a convex lens. We have an object here. And what do you see here is this object. It has, there is a beta, which is a semi-convergence ang angle. And it's the light, in this case, it is following with this beta angle into this convex lens and the image is formed here. Yeah. Right now. Okay, I think I should bring the laser pointer then. I don't know why you cannot see that because maybe it's a zoom screen. Okay. You know how to. Hmm. This is tricky. I'll try to order a order a laser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we go out of here, then you know. Laser pointer. Oh, <laughs> that's so cool, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, and this is now is another example. So when you try to construct these ray diagrams, what do you see? So here there is an elongated object now. We have an arrow. So the line which passes through the center of the lens, it's not bending, right? There is, because it is passing through the center, it is not going through that refractive changes. Whereas the lines which are parallel, they will meet at a point. And keep in mind, this is a back focal plane. I will move with more uh, complicated diagrams of PEM. And uh, say so these terms should be clear to you of what is optical axis, what is back focal. Back focal plane is a plane where all the parallel lines after passing through the lens, they meet, right? And then after the focal plane, you have something called an image plane. An image plane is the plane where your image would be formed, right? Any questions on this one? Easy, right? Now, we talk about uh, more, more complicated stuff. Um, now, this is also very easy. This is a, simply a ray diagram of another object here. And it is just telling the same thing. Uh, any line which is passing through the center of the lens, you see that it's passing straight. All the other one, they're trying to converge at one point, right? And where they're converging, it's again a back focal plane, and they are trying to form 
an image at an image plane. Now, you know this uh, definition since childhood, one plus u, one by u plus one by v is equal to one by f. Now, why this thing is very important? This thing is extremely important in terms of electron microscopy because we change our focal, our, our focal plane by changing the focus. And we can change the focus of all the microscopy by changing the current. So this diagram, which is an optical illustration, you just see that our focus is same. So these diagrams are very easy. But in electron microscopy, you're constantly changing the position of this back focal plane. Hence, you are changing the focus. Hence, you are changing the U. And hence, you are changing the V. Now, why these are important? Because you can take out and calculate the magnification from these lenses. Now, if you look here in this one, we have calculated the magnification of any object. And you will also be calculating. So as I told you, in, in electron microscope, we, we can move these planes by changing the focus, right? So here, uh, you see that this is an image which is formed with focus F1. Here, the smaller focus, um, you will have a smaller image distance here because the image would be formed a little bit earlier. So uh, this one, as you see, F1 is corresponding to this uh, focal plane. And now the image is formed earlier with V1. And if I move and try to focus it a little bit further, then I would move the image plane a little bit at the bottom. So for magnetic lens, this one is the strong excitation, this condition. When you try to focus at a very small distance, you will have a condition where it is known as strong excitation and it is also known as less magnification, right? So you have to always compromise. More magnification you have in electron microscopy, you will have less excitation. What does that mean? Less excitation, when you have, you will have also the problem with, uh, with the imaging conditions at higher, um, at higher magnification, you will have the condition, you will have the images that are more, uh, how to say, more blur, not so perfect. Resolution won't be great. So there's always a compromise with the magnification versus the excitation that you found. And what is the general, um, you, if you go through my papers, I have done images up to five, 500,000 X. That is, you can easily go with these. People claim 1 million, uh, one million times, uh, it's it's more tough. But 500,000 times, it's a very common thing that people do it. Because, but at 500,000 times, from 200,000 uh, times, between 200,000 and 500,000 times, you really lose a lot of resolution. What you see is blurry. You are literally trying to uh, use a lot of tools, extra tools to, to interpret the image. And uh, this is one of, um, the like uh, right now we are still working on a very basic example here uh, so this is you are seeing in an optical microscope that this is how it changes but in electron microscope it changes very quickly now this is to you it might be looking wrong that i have three ray diagrams one is over focused another is focused and other is under focused and most of you would say, hey, why would you, you know, first and third are wrong? Because they are not focused. And I want a focus image. But to your surprise, a lot of microscopy measurements we do in over-focus and under-focus condition. And this is depending upon the experiments you have. For example, in the next slide, uh, this is one of my papers that uh, I think I post published in 2016. And here I have imaged helium bubble. And in helium bubbles, what do you see here? This kind of analysis we do using over focus and under focus condition. If I present a focused image here, you see that 
and nothing that is seen. And this is this is a technique that we use. In this technique, you see here all the highlighted bubbles inside the inside the highlighted. You see white here. The same thing becomes black here. Then it becomes overcoated. So in in any paper right now, it's the beginning of um, this microscopy learning. Any paper that I review, or anyone reviews my paper, and if we claim them, this is helium bubble. What do they want to know? They want both over focus and under focus images. That's the proof. If it doesn't change the contrast, so when it is under focus, it has to be a white spot. When it becomes over focus, it would be a black spot. The same thing. And uh, this is, you see in all the images, so this was um, a sample that I did. It was titanium nitride. It was a ceramic that was implanted with helium. And I was trying to study helium diffusion into this material. So we uh, annealed the samples at 1373 Kelvin, which would be equal to something like, uh, I think, uh, 1,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this was at 1,200 degrees Celsius. And this one was at 1,600 degrees Celsius. Uh, and uh, all these things, what we see is we start seeing the formation of bubbles at 1,000 degrees Celsius into this one. It's 11, 1100 degrees Celsius. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I know because I'm mentioning in Celsius because all the furnaces that we have, we use in Celsius uh, into our labs. And what we see is the, the formation of bubbles. And the best way to characterize it, take them to the microscope and start changing the focus. That means you are literally um, bringing your condition from here to over focus to under focus. And how do you change the focus of any, any lens? By simply changing the current in case of your electron microscope. In case of your optical microscope, you're changing the distance manually. Uh, in this, you cannot change it, but you can play with the, with the, with the current conditions, right? And then another example, it was a paper that I published also in 2018. And there, we were not seeing bubbles but we were seeing carbon packets. So this is something that I did in silicon carbide. In silicon carbide, you have some kind of extra carbon which agglomerate to find this extra packets between the grains. So here on, on the screen, what you see is I have got some unirradiated sample. In the unirradiated sample, this is silicon carbide fiber and you have extra packets which are present and seen in this kind of, you know, um, these kind of polygonal shapes which are white. And once I change the focus, it becomes into this black. Right? So, this kind of analysis where it's changing with white is changing to black by changing the focus of the microscope. It's one of the most common analysis we do. But my question to you is very physics based, and I would like one of you to go to the go through the books of William and Carter and come with a ray diagram to discuss why for some features changing the focus would change their contrast. And once we discuss the ray diagram, we know that why it happens, what is happening. Right, that would also give you an idea about the contrast. Mm -hmm. The next class, or uh, we, we will discuss. So I would, I would start discussing more. I don't want this class to be more cramming, because I want you to understand these tools more, more like very, you know, in a very easy, easy way. So this is something that we did. So this was unaggregated. I think most of you are familiar here. What is BPA? Here, what is BPA? So why do we do that, DPA? Of your nuclear, of the damage. So guys, as meter, nanometer, centimeter is a unit that we use for length. 
Similar to that, GPA is a unit that we use to measure the damage. And it's the, it's the, it's the unit that we use to uh, measure the damage that is caused by an atom. That's why we call it displacement for atom. Mm -hmm. Right. And we are moving here 1 GPA, 10 GPA, 50 GPA. Can anyone guess who, which are the conditions it is used for? Uh, am I testing it for light water reactors? What is the maximum dose that the light water reactor goes in its lifetime? Well, so far, I know, like, uh, I read a paper last year about flux symbol two in the BWR that got up to, in like, close to 100. right? What would be the normal behavior? That's, that's the normal number. 20 and extended maximum. <clears throat> so between 20 and 50 dB would be the maximum number that any, um, like what a reactor structure would experience uh, in its lifetime. That is over the use of 60 years, which is but these days we extend the lifetime. So this was test for high temperature reactors, for reactors that uh, basically uh, for ADF, accident tolerant uh, development. This was the material and we were testing it at very high doses. And what we see that, this was an experiment that we did as I increase the dose from 100 radiated to 1 GPA to 10 GPA to 50 GPA, what I see gradually, the density of this carbon packet starts diminishing. And in the final one, there is nothing at 50 GPA, there is no carbon packet left. So this is one of the examples of the studies that we can do by changing the over-focus and under-focus. This is the most easier technique after taking the images. The first thing should be that you should know how to use a microscope to take the images. And then this is the second technique that would be taught to you. I know this stuff is exclusive to the and I'm not so sure that the results are so. But why are, the, uh, why are those carbon packets? Why does those carbon packets form? So this is a kind of material that we want to be as pure as possible. This is a fiber. And the fiber uh, is something, uh, the very thin kind of, um, mm -hmm. thin kind of, material, kind of a pipe, you can say, which is braided. And it's braided into form a composite. And then that composite is applied to your, um, around your fume. So you can simply, simply replicate it by hair, you know, and it's braided. And the point is that these fibers, are the level, these are generation four fibers. That is one of the latest fibers in the industry that we are able to form because you really need a long cylindrical tube. So they go under a process called pyrolysis. And with this process, we are able to generate these special fiber, which is simply silicon carbide. But till now, we are unable to create a fiber without carbon impurity. These are the impurities. And these impurities uh, are extra carbon that is present. And finally, they agglomerate to form a packet. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Uh, the, for dislocations and everything, if you're on the zone axis, you will see them like that. But generally, you don't change focus and over focus to image them. So, what is the thing that you can sense from here? Cavities, which has a volume, they change the contrast. Mm -hmm. Precipitates, which doesn't have a volume inside, volume would mean an empty volume that would not change the contrast. So, if I give you a sample, which consists of precipitates versus bubbles. How do you separate them? You simply take them to the microscope, start playing with the focus. If it changes the focus, you would say, hey, there's some kind of cavity here. And there are sometimes not bubbles. One of my samples that I did, there was just cavities present, uh, you know, in, uh, in as manufactured sample. So 
this is different, you know, uh, way to analyze. Any other question before I move? Sure thing for cavities or focus versus under focus is that change the size of the feature that you decide you observe, I should right. say. So now we are getting uh, pretty fine. When we manipulate the microscope, we have to really manipulate the microscope very fine. So for example, if your zero is your condition, which is your focus condition, you would not see anything. You would see literally like the same. And then I start changing it. And literally it's in nanometers that I change. And I have to be very, very much, how to say, um, like my steps should be very small. I'm not going to a very big, big steps. Because if you go and take very big steps, then you are changing also the, all the also the length of the of the of the feature. Or in this case, you would change to the radius of the feature. I don't know if you could relate. I have to really take you to the microscopy, you know, lectures and start, you know, seeing just showing you everything. So any other question? Image uh, bubble analysis, how do you do? This is one of the, you know, one project. One project any one of you could take. Or in the microscopy class, I would like to two people do one project. This would be really good. One to one, two people, it would be a buddy system where, you know, you can generate a lot of, uh, you know, interactions. And if, yeah, I think I decided with two or three homework that I would give, and I would give everything in terms of projects. There is nothing, you know, there's nothing in microscopy that you can, you know, do until you have a project. Project, are we collecting? I wish that I would love that, you know, get this new microscope working, and at least I have, I can train you, and once you train, you can, but it's, it's also very tight, in three months, you cannot do all, there are at least 20 techniques that I would be going with, so I would like you to discuss those techniques, bring more papers, draw array diagrams, and trying to generate a discussion, and then I take you to the lab, and maybe show you. Because honestly, microscopy needs two things. One is persistence. And a lot of other students I know who started learning microscopy, but they gave up microscopy because of the time it needs. So expectation is that from this class is to present to you all of it, and then you can choose. And definitely, if you are a student who wants and have time and want to go and learn deeper, you always have that opportunity, but uh, trust me, it takes time. Like single alignment would take you five weeks to learn. Uh, and before that, you have to you have to prepare the sample. So I can take you to that route, but it's it's not an easy route, right? That's why, yeah. Okay, now I will move to another topic. What is resolution in PEM and um, can anyone explain to me? To the people online, maybe I become, I have to sign again. Because I'm, yeah. Okay. This Zoom is of 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. <laughs> what do you understand by resolution in general? Recording in progress. <laughs> what is the resolution of our eyes? I have a scale. I might not be able to see more than a line, a millimeter line. 2.1 millimeter line, I won't be able to distinguish it with two lines. That is the resolution of my eyes. Right? To the microscope, the resolution is very high. So now we'll discuss the electromagnetic lenses. In fact, last time I told you so, much, much more hard. We are limited by what are the magnetic lenses? Now, any idea, any inputs? Here on the screen, you see that. Instead of using glass to bend optical light, clear. we use electromagnetic and, uh, fields to bend the path of electrons. Right. Why can't we use optical lenses? And why? Because the electrons would interact with the field. Right. So, depending upon the source, we have. 
we would use the cannot be bigger than the wavelength of your source because our source is electron and so what is happening here when it's a wavelength that is giving you a resolution it cannot be bigger than that about optical axis. So here, this is what is fine. Just to align the electron optical axis. Your electron. Uh, that is the number one purpose. Your, so maybe the, maybe we have got the source. I discussed about the two sources in the last class. Can anyone remind me what are the two common sources? Cannot be smaller than the wave. And then discussed about what this diagram is coming from. Your bionic and. Uh, so this is clearly. Field uh, and field emission. Very good. These are the two common. Sources uh, that we have, uh, both of them are generated. Uh, we know that we, electron electron what is the other property of electron beam that we learned, which was very important? Right. Is that right. temporal coherence? Right. That no two electrons, they are falling on your sample at one time. There's a difference. So it is just, a lot of people say, at one time. Now, resolution is some, given by something uh, you can calculate uh, by the Rayleigh criteria. Now, because of this, now, what is the Rayleigh criteria? In the Rayleigh criteria, maybe it's a good question that could be asked. You have a resolution which is given by problem, this delta this here, is because of this which is directly proportional to your wavelength. Now, lambda. Here on the, screen, this is a the higher is the wavelength. Our electromagnetic lenses are literally like this. Higher is the. And uh, this right. is in the center, I think. So, it's that's you see here. Of, you have the lambda. And it's 400 yeah, nanometer for visible light and 0 0.004 nanometer for 100 keV electron. And mu is your refractive index. Beta is your semi-angle of collection, which is here. So on this one, you see a very simple um, ray diagram again. You have this optical axis. You have a beam, which is angle of convergence at alpha. And then everything along the optical axis, as usual, and then it's going to an aperture here. And this uh, beam is getting scattered. And there is general scattering angle theta. And there's a collection angle, which is beta. So I would go in into the following classes, um, in the following slides, that what is your aperture? So in this one, we are not collecting the entire light, which is falling from the specimen. We are controlling what we want. And this is a very common uh, kind of maneuver that we do in microscope by inserting the apertures. It's nothing. It's a small, small uh, disk that we have inserted. It's a cross section that is shown in the image. And this is uh, where we use it in calculating the resolution, not your scattering angle, but your collection angle. And this is given by this formula. And when you try to calculate it, you can calculate it, calculate the resolution for for any any instrument, right? Um, I believe it is a fixed property. Yeah, definitely. Yes. It's the refractive index of the lens. Because, uh, yeah, a specimen won't have a refractive index in your lens. It's always through the lens. No, I don't see. And then uh, we have something uh, here that we see as numerical aperture that you, you call it as mu sine beta, which is simply, again, coming from this property of an aperture. Right? Now, at the end, there is a statement you cannot achieve the theoretical diffraction limit due to the imperfection of the lenses. So with this formula, I think you should be able to calculate yeah. any any resolution, right? Okay. Now, this is one of the examples. I think one of you asked um, that can we change the object length when we change the focus, right? So this is in specimen here. And here are the lenses, right? And uh, this is, first one is your under focus image. This is your in focus image. And this is your over focus image. So you see that all of these things, they look different, right? Yes, a question. Okay, 
Yeah, I am also just a little bit here, you know, I'm thinking that there's some one line is missing okay. here. So yeah. this is um, the electron beam yeah, ask the question. the optical axis and this is the electron trajectory which you see with the green color here and these are the lenses which are, these are the magnetic Most field applied, which is simply or, yeah. going to kind of the right steer it and bringing it to a focal point. Yeah, in so this is also like, uh, very important um, for uh, yeah. really yeah. for the microscopy to be able to understand how is your um, magnetic field changing? Now, what is happening? Yeah, I'll get back to um, I'll get this, back on this one. How is the image okay. happening? Okay, so, so this what is, is the basic yes. difference in the optical lens versus the magnetic lens. So, any idea that you see from the screen? Oh, yeah. Maybe it should be known. What is something that you see from the screen? What is the difference between magnetic lens versus optical lens? Hold on. Yeah, this is some, uh, yeah, there's missing the uh, slide is, somewhere. Is your electron what? source. Your electron source is a kind of, you know, this kind of a... Okay, I make a note of it and I'll get back to you. Yeah, this coming straight. Mm -hmm. Versus optical, right. it's a straight. So source. this is how your... This uh, is one of the key differences between okay. the two sources. So when, once it is coming as this kind of spiral, it is able to, you know, you can actually rotate the image. Image is rotated and inverted. Versus in this case, it's very simple. It is formed as in any day item that I showed you before. And you can simply... So this is not the classic difference. Basically start making it from here to here. Now, we come to, after lenses, there's something called epergent. I think I already talked about it. But you can control it uh, by taking a small section. You have the source you, When you start doing these kind of measurements. Depending upon the characterization you are doing, you can change. Okay. So I would move now to something. Electromagnetic lenses. And which would be changed by. So I will again sign emotions. up on the Zoom. And how can you do it? You can simply uh, play with these yeah. holes here that is shown, right? It's nothing. It's a kind of a plate that is inserted into your microscope below the sample. And if you, you know, want a smaller aperture, you choose a smaller aperture. And if you want a slightly bigger aperture, you choose a slightly bigger aperture and you use a very big aperture. Right? And this is how you control the amount of light falling on your specimen. Now, we come and uh, we come to the new topic where I would explain something about the astigmatism of lenses. One very annoying thing that you have to go through is to fix the astigmatism of your condenser lens in your microscope. Now, what is the astigmatism? Can anyone generate a discussion on it? It's like when the focal length of the X direction is different than the focal length of the Y direction, kind of, you know, have a single point focus. Yep. Any other point? So, he said it very right. So, he simply said that it arises from the difference in the focal positions at two different axes. So, what is happening on the screen? You see a point object here. Here is your lens. And what happens, you know, what do you see? Different, so this is your Z focal plane and this is your Y focal plane. And what do you see at Z focal plane? Your um, lines are meeting at a different point versus a Y focal plane where it is meeting at a, another point. But they should meet at the same point, right? Generally. And this astigmatism is also, it's not only in uh, your uh, electron microscopy lenses, but it's also in your normal lenses that you wear. Like any, any glasses that you wear. So finally, the astigmatism is simply, which arises from the difference in focal positions between the electron beams passing on two axes, orthogonal to optical axis. And we, what we want is to try to correct it. Now, as an analogy, this is one of the astigmatism uh, image that we are seeing from SEM, not from TEM. Because in the SEM, we are seeing an overview. So what happens in this 
mechanism, how do you check it? One of the ways to check it is to go to under focus and over focus condition. And if under, under focus and over focus condition, your length and the dimension of the object or the feature changes, it has stigmatism to it. It should not change. Right? Like this is your classic here, this is your uh, you know, beautiful focused image. And if you are changing the dimensions, here you see that it's also changing the length. So one of the one of the classic ways to change the focus, check if the dimensions are changing. Now, what do you see on the screen? Is it about a condenser stigmatism? Do you know what is condenser in the microscope? No. No. Yeah. Uh, wait, it's like it's like the lens is right before the the focal plane. Right. right. So after, so I have to, so this is how here, this is how your system works. You have an electron gun. You have a condenser lens system. Your condenser lens system is very important. What does it do? Condenser lens system, the main purpose of condenser lens system is to bring the light or is to bring the electron to your sample. This is the entire system that is trying to steer your electron gun. And this is simply done by lenses. That, that means we have magnets that are just trying to steer the path of the electron. And we have something, after these lenses, we have something called condenser stigmata. And then we have an aperture which would control the amount of light falling. So overall, in microscopy, if you just remember this very easy um, illustration, we have electron source, then we have a condenser system, which is consist of different lenses, lenses, stigmator and aperture. Then you have objective lens, where it consists of objective lens, objective stigmator and objective aperture. And then we have projector lens, where it helps you to project the image into your, uh, your uh, green, green screen that you see. Right? So, in everything we have a corrector. In the condenser we have a condenser stigmator. In the objective we have objective stigmator. So, how does your beam looks like? How do you know your um, your electron beam has some astigmatism? So, when you see the beam on the screen, this is how you see. This is simply the shots that has been taken from the computer which is taking the image of your beam size or the beam spot. When your beam, it has an astigmatism, it won't be a round beam versus it would be an elliptical beam. Once you see this, what you do is to make it round. And how do you do that? It is simply by series of two knobs, you go to the astigmatism setting and you start playing the current. And you try to find a condition x and y, so basically you are working with x and y now to make it round and come to this, this condition here, right? Now, today, I, like most of the lecture is based on discussing the properties of the lenses that we use. Another problem that we have with the lenses is the spherical aberration after the astigmatism. What happens in the spherical aberration? It is present when the outer parts of the lens do not bring light rays into the same focus as the central part. So you see on the image, you see that here in the bottom lens, you see that the sides are bringing, are not bringing the rays to the focus. Versus the center one, they are getting focused. Right? So this kind of problem is known as spherical aberration due to the geometry of the lens. And how do you correct it? Have you had a question? I, I was just wondering, is that because like the magnetic field is just like happens to be stronger like, next to the full piece than towards Exactly. The, okay. So everything you will correlate here from the optical lenses because it's just like uh, difficult to to show you the magnetic lens. Like this is a classical coursework that I have taken from you know any other any book. Like it's available very generally on, on, on internet. So my question he he asked 
uh, he asked a very good question. He asked that why do we have a spherical aberration in a magnetic lens? That was a question. An answer to it was at the sides there would be a different magnetic field due to which at sides it will it will be focusing in a very different way. Now again, how do you correct it? So there is always a stigmator. That's why they have given it. They have given something small, another uh, stigmator that will correct it for everything, whether it's in condenser or in objective. So that means stigmatism come as a how to say it's an unavoidable thing. It comes as a property of the lenses, right? Now on the screen, what happens? Like it's right now show it's shown that spherical aberration. What it does? It reduces the resolution. You remember the Rayleigh criteria that we just discussed? In that criteria, R was the resolution, and it was directly given by this formula: 0.61 lambda by mu sine beta, right? And now this R, which was theoretical, due to the spherical aberration, it changes, and this is given this form, where R is basically now under root of additions of squares of theoretical versus aberrated one, right? And what you call is uh, finally you get something like this, where you are adding a component of the spherical, and where C S is your is your uh, lens. There's a coefficient due to aberration. And finally, your formula, which is your lambda by beta, it becomes like this, and this is the final R minimum, which comes as as a component of um, your correcting spherical aberration. I, I, you don't need to get into the detail, but just having this this formula next to you, where you're trying to tell that how is my resolution changing with uh, your spherical aberration, would be a great thing. So here, you anything would be given to you as the lambda would be the wavelength of your source. This would be your spherical aberration, and you will get something called your practical resolution. Now, after that, there is something that is uh, other thing that is known as chromatic aberration. Now, what is chromatic aberration? This is another uh, imperfection of the lens. It is the defect of the lens due to which the image of the white object formed by a lens is colored or blurred. What does that mean? Yes. Some wavelengths are bent more strongly than others. And why is that? Um, well, electron microscope case, I think it's because like higher energy electrons are bent even less strongly. In the electron microscopy, because of the temporal coherence, we have this problem. Majority, all of the electrons are not falling at the same time, so we cannot do anything. When they are not falling at the same time, that means they have different wavelengths, slightly different wavelength. This is what is happening here. You have, you know, these are your example again shown from the optical purposes. Now here it passes through the lens, and you know there are different wavelengths. Ultimately, we have a different situation where the wavelength is slightly different. You know, in all cases, because if you remember, there was a temporal concept delta e that I found in the last class, which was equal to I think some k e, right? Like small e, that was the number. From the last class, I think I have to check that. But there is a slight difference in EV, which leads to this kind of chromatic aberration. Any question before we move to FIB? 15 minutes of the class. What is FIB? Focus on me. Focus on me. Focus on me. Yeah. Any other question before we move to the section? Right. I think your practical session can happen any time. Next two weeks, any time. I would just give you the date. Mm -hmm. Idea will be to. I'll also try to generate a lot of discussion with the previous students I trained about the practical limitation that we have, uh, especially dealing with uh, nuclear engineering samples. So focus ion beam. <laughs> so what is focus ion beam? Focused ion beam is based on similar technology as of SIMS. SIMS is secondary ion mass spectrometer.
microscopy. Has anyone worked with it? What a sense. It's not like glancing ions. It's just on like the very surface of the material. It sputters, right? Yeah. I thought, I thought it was like more like scattering. Um, I don't know, somehow it sputtered. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's scattering, but it's able to, it's, it's able to take the material out. That's why it's sputtering. So, what is happening here is, we have a material here, you can see atoms, and what is happening, your ion beam is, is falling onto your sample, and it is able to eject these atoms, which is able to create a sputtering. Mm -hmm. And this was a technique that we used in the past, and what we did was, it was ion mass spectroscopy, so in this technique, you can take any sample, in sense, it would tell you what is the composition of the sample. Because we just place the sample under an ion beam and atoms start to sputter and we have, an, have a mass spectrometer by knowing the mass of the atom you can know what element does it have, right? Now, what happens is, of course it uses a very high focus ion beam, generally oxygen or cesium. But in our case, what we use in focus ion beam? Which? Gallium. gallium. We are using gallium which sputters the material from a selected area. Now, as I told you, this uh, ejected secondary ions pass through a mass spectrometer which separates the ions according to their mass to charge ratio, in effect providing chemical analysis of a very small sample volume. So you have to imagine now this technique was converted into an FIB, which is an ion milling technique. Before I get into the details, why do we need FIB? Why can't we do this thing by mechanical polishing? In the past, FIB was not there when Steve did his PhD. FIB wasn't there. Then how, still he did a lot of microscopy. His PhD was on microscopy. Mm -hmm. Then how was, how were we preparing the samples? Initially grinding and then final, pol final step electro polishing. So today you saw in the lab where we just went for a safety trip. You were not there, Tommy, but other people were. So we had a grinding machines. So we simply take a sample holder, we stick the sample to that, and we take it on a polishing beam. So basically what we are doing, we are simply, you know, this is your notebook, big, thick notebook. We are trying to convert this into a paper. This is the ultimate aim. And we have to do it successfully. That means going from one millimeter sample to a nanometer sample. Mm -hmm. The final thing would be a nanometer. Now going to this, this thin material, what do you imagine? It will break for 90% of the cases. So when we used to do mechanical polishing, which was simply putting your sample and grinding it, just grinding it, as you would grind anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And once you reduce it to that thin thing, it would break. So there were times that it used to break and if so and when you grind it, when you are at a very final step of grinding, you are going very, very slowly not to break it. And different material can have different uh, problems. For example, ceramic, they are brittle. They would break very easily. I did it in my PhD, some samples by that. So this is one of the common problems that we had. So with FIB today, we can make a sample in three hours, which is great. But what is the main challenges with FIB that you think? In terms of when I'm doing mechanical polishing, I'm giving it a kind of mechanical damages in terms of dislocations because I'm, I'm constantly trying to grind something. And if it's a steel piece, and it can also deform with the force that I apply. So overall, I am giving it a mechanical damage, which is extra dislocations I am giving. Mm -hmm. But in, in case of this sophisticated technique, what we are giving it in case of FIB, we are giving it a lot of iron damage to our material. Mm -hmm. So when we start doing it, it is very easy. You have a very thick piece of metal. You are trying to grind it into a very thin piece. 
and you're using your ion beam, which simply takes it. So we call it like as you you know as you have seen feathers. So it's just, this is a sample. So you just put your ion beams in a way that you know it's so light the energy of the ion that it literally removes it like this, especially at the end part. So in the beginning you have a thicker piece, then it becomes very thin, and when you start thinning it at the end step, you keep the energy very very low, and that procedure goes for 30 minutes to an hour and you do like a feathering and you remove it like this. You don't go like this, boom, 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 you know? And that is how you control the damage. So overall, the disadvantage of ion beam is that if your characterization somehow superimposes with your damage, whatever you are characterizing your feature, you won't be able to have good image. And this happens most of the time. To be a good microscopist, what is the number one thing? Is to be very good at making samples. If you can make very good samples, your microscopy task, you excel at it. From any other microscopist who might be knowing all crystallography and who is like really James Bond mm -hmm. at doing microscope. Because you, when you have a sample, you know, you do a lot of, uh, you create a lot of damage. 